Okay, we're going to look now, continue to look at our Christian response to the challenges facing Christianity. And we left off by talking about some of Reed's thoughts. Also, a, a philosopher by the name of Stuart, who was influenced by Reed. And now we come to an interesting man named Rawls, w, uh, R-A-W-L-S, Rawls. <clears throat> now, he had a, a thought experiment. He had a very interesting thought experiment that I think shows the principle that there is absolute right and wrong. And this is a very practical, down-to-earth thought experiment that I think has a lot of merit. Here it is. He said, if any typical individual or social group... Now, imagine that you're, you're part of this group, okay? Try to put yourself into this thought experiment, that you're going to participate in this, this uh, experiment. If any typical individual or social group were given the task of creating a new nation, a new government system with laws. So let's imagine that this classroom is going to create a new nation. The nation of Faith Seminary Classroom A. Okay, we're going to create our own nation. Create our own government. And we're the citizens of this new government that we're going to create. But they, or we in this case, do not know in advance where and how we're going to fit in. So we don't, we don't know who among us will be the president and who is going to be uh, the citizens. So, we have to assume that we might be in a, in a future position of non-control. So we're, all, we're going to all work together to create a new government for our new nation right here. But none of us at this point knows if we'll be in a position of power. So we, we might be under someone's power. We have no control as we plan our new nation. So he says, if that were the case, how would we design this new government for our future nation made up from this classroom? How would we design this? Well, without reading further. Now, if you read too far, don't say anything. Just think about it. If we were going to create our own nation called Faith Seminary Nation Classroom A and have our own government, and you have, you have to assume that you will not be in a position of power, what do you think you're going to say with, as your input into creating this new, nation, this new nation of ours and our new government? What do you think you might say since you might be in a position of not having any power? What kind of a nation are, are, are you interested in creating in, in case you're a person without any power in the future nation? So-called democratic. Which, okay, you said so-called democratic, which means that you're interested in what? what how would that help you if you don't have any power? It would help, help me feel that I would be a part of it. Okay, uh, if it's semi-democratic, you have a say in what happens, you have a vote, okay. What else comes to your mind that you'd like to see in, ca in case you don't have much power in this future co government? Law. You would want rule of law. Why? Even the playing field. Okay, to even the playing field. So in case something happens to you uh, that might harm you, there's uh, recourse. You have a law, you can say, well, this, this was uh, done to me and this law protects me. Not necessarily for tax and retribution or okay. something like that, just that there's a standard, this is what the standard is. Okay. In order to, to keep chaos down to a minimum, we should have some semblance of law okay. to form a culture. So you want, you want a way to form a standard to allow a minimum of order and uh, structure to society, okay? Uh, anybody else have an idea how you, how you would want to protect yourself in case you don't have much power after, after we make our final decision for our government? Is there anybody here um, who, would, who would really say, I don't really care if there's any kind of a standard about right and wrong. Uh, whatever happens, happens. 
Uh, no. It doesn't really matter what happens to me in terms of right or wrong, because there's no real right or wrong. If you knew you'd be in, in, in a position of, not, of no power, but <clears throat> you're not willing to uh, set up a standard of right and wrong, you would just you know, take your chances that there would be no absolute right or wrong. Do you think that would be normal for a person to, to want to have a government that way? No. Okay, look at what he says here. And he did, a, he did a lot of surveys, okay? He did a lot of testing and thinking to see how this would go. And this is what he came up with. The probable result would be the same universally. A golden rule kind of system. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay? In case you have no power in the future, you would certainly hope that people who do have power would not what? Abuse it and do to you what you would not fairly do to them. That you would treat each other with fairness. Okay, so there's a universal idea of fairness, justice. One of the most common things that you can find with Eskimos or anybody else is the idea across the board, a universal principle or law or concept of fairness. Isn't that one of the first things kids, kids learn as they fight in the back seat when you're going on a trip? That's not fair. They're on my side of the car. This is my side, that's your side. You got on my side. He pinched me. That's not fair. You know? Where do, where do kids get that concept? Yeah. You know, African kids, uh, Thai, Thailand kids, Chinese kids, American kids, Indian kids. And they could be kept apart for a millennia before we discovered, you know, each hemisphere, uh, cultures that were split up and separated and didn't, didn't know about each other. They've all had that idea of fairness. But that's not fair. Mm-hmm. How can that be explained if there's no absolute right or wrong? So in this government, <coughs> he says, people would have a golden rule kind of system because you want to make sure you're protected if you don't have much power. That means a system of fairness. That's a basic human concept and practice. We might not follow it, but we know it's there. You know, bank robbers might break the law, steal the money from the bank, but as soon as they lose their money from the, from the hideout while they're taking their naps, they, they know there's a fairness going on here that's, that's not being uh, applied. It's unfair that that guy took our money from the bank heist. So they know about this law of fairness, justice, and equality. Therefore, this is evidence of the existence of a real, universal, ideal, and theoretically achievable right and wrong. So that makes sense, this experiment? Yeah. Do you think that would happen? If you, if you went to Thailand, China, Russia, Eskimos, you'd get the same kind of feeling that they would want to have protections in this creating of a new government? And they would, they would want an idea of fairness to be put in place. So if they don't have any power and they're stepped on by somebody, they can appeal in this new government to the idea of fairness. You think that's true universally? I do. So far it always has been. Every culture that we know of has ever existed. And we have how many cultures today? 24, About 24,000 cultures. What a strange coincidence that all 24,000 have an idea of fairness. And all cultures that ever existed had the idea of fairness. Even before they knew about each other from uh, discoveries by uh, Columbus or Magellan or whoever, they all had these separated cultures. They didn't know that other people existed across the ocean. And they all had fairness everywhere you went. The idea of fairness. Again, even, even uh, lawbreakers, thieves, they might not be fair, but they know what? Fairness. They know if fairness exists. Because when it happens to them, hey, that's not fair. That fellow bank robber took my money. Or as C.S. Lewis said so eloquently, I refer to it uh, many times, step on the foot of a relativist. And will that be considered relative? 
Mm-hmm. Step hard on the foot of a relativist, and that will not be considered by the relativist with an aching foot. That's relative. It's so not right or wrong. They will universally feel the pain in my foot is wrong. Just like when preached, it somehow it just seemed wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's a universal law. We, we know it instinctively that only people in WHW know how to preach. Uh, it's just universal law. I have a question for you. I'm a teacher, so I win. <laughs> Universal law. Teachers always win. Until class is over, and then poof, poof, poof. Meet you the playground. Okay, Moreland and Craig. As in J.P. Moreland and W.L. W. Craig. He's referring to Mackey. So look, look at the top of your page. Remember Mackey, his argument of queerness? Strange argument called queerness. Here's his response to him. If real morals exist, then why should they be like non-moral things? In other words, you cannot judge non-material morals by material science. There are different categories. It's like judging apples from oranges. So he says, why should X kinds of things, like morals, be like Y kinds of things, non-morals, such as mountains and food? Mackey is biasly not allowing for differences of categories. And that's the problem today with materialism or naturalistic evolutionism or macroevolutionism. They don't even consider that there's another category called non-matter. Or in this case, non-absolute morality. If you read the literature enough on the debate between creationism or intelligent design and macroevolutionism, we discussed this uh, yesterday after class, they get angry, that is the evolutionary teachers, they even get angry at the suggestion they should even question that there's another category. If you say, have you ever thought seriously about there being a spiritual realm a non-material realm, they don't even want to think about that as even a possibility or even question that that there might be such a thing. They're not applying the the principles of a good detective who would be open to all the evidence and, and, and follow the evidence where it leads without prejudging it. Look at the last sentence under Moreland. And Craig, if Mackey's view is consistently followed, then one must also reject the real existence of other non-physical things. Now, these are things, here's four examples. What are they? Numbers, Numbers, logic, universals, and love. Universals are things that everybody uses and and believes in. In fact, numbers are a universal. Everybody has numbers. Everybody has the concept of numbers. Everybody uses mathematics to some degree. So math- mathematics is a universal practice. But <clears throat> what uh, J.L. Mackey doesn't realize, apparently, is that numbers are not material. It's a concept. Logic is not a material thing. It's a concept. And universals are not material things. Love is not a material thing. And those things are also absolutes. Now, of course, we have this thing called new math, which means there's no real answer. Is that how it goes? There's no right or wrong answer? But that's a modern-day strange exception to the history of mathematics. Uh, yes, there are strange things that happen, like, like uh, in... Um, Uh, quantum physics in quantum physics of which I'm no expert at least I I think I know enough to say that in quantum physics strange things have been found to happen at the microscopic level they don't always follow pure logic but in terms of basic math 
1 plus 1 equals 2 if we, if we depart from that we're in big trouble because if your car needs four tires and we think that well I'll put three on there it doesn't really matter there's no right answer put three tires in the car not four you're going to have problems <laughs> so uh, up until now numbers have been a, a universal thing in, in terms of basic math logic if you, if you violate the law of non-contradiction you're going to have problems uh, that's a universal thing to, to follow non-contradiction love such as the golden rule that's a universal it's an absolute if you don't practice the golden rule you have injustice you violate justice and fairness so, so he's saying to Mackey that if you reject morality what else, what, what else should they reject to be uh, consistent Numbers. Numbers. Universals, love. Universals, logic, and love. But Mackey doesn't reject those things. But they're all in the same category. They're all in the non-material category. And they're all absolutes. Okay, regarding Adolf Hitler. Do you think that most relativists criticize Hitler? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now there are you might you may be surprised to hear this there are, there are some cultures that praise Hitler. Uh, I know one in particular in Micronesia where we used to live. Uh, one culture we know of admires him, uh, in, in even him killing the Jews and his using power the way he did. But most people since World War II, including relativists, criticize Hitler. Can relativists consistently with their own view? Criticize Hitler? No. no. Why not? Because that was his truth. Yeah. That was that was whose truth? Hitler's truth. Yeah. He was perfectly justified in doing what he did according to relativism because that was okay. his truth. Okay, so relativists cannot criticize Hitler because it's Hitler's truth to kill Jews. It might not be the relativist truth, but the relativist cannot judge Hitler because Hitler did what he thought was true for him. And all truths are valid. And all truths are valid. All truths are equal to another. They're all relative, which means that my truth is equal to your truth. Mine's not better, mine's not worse than your truth. So, but yet, relativists break their own principle by criticizing Hitler. Now look on the board here. Here's our question. Is it really wrong to think there's a real right and wrong? We keep seeing these things called self-defeating statements. How does that sentence itself kill itself defeat itself is it wrong people who say there's no real right or wrong what are they saying they're saying that you people who believe in right and wrong are wrong absolutely wrong can they really say that and be relativists no no they're contradicting their own view. All they can say is, about your view of right and wrong, is, hmm. All they can say is, hmm. You believe in right and wrong. Hmm. I don't. They can do that, but they can never say, you're wrong. I'm right. You should be a relativist. Relativism is right, and non-relativism is wrong. They can't do that without destroying their own view. All they can do is say, hmm. How do you spell hmm? I don't know. But if you burn down their house, because in your view, that's your truth, burning down houses, I doubt they would go when their house is burning, hmm. No, they wouldn't do that. They would say, that's wrong. So, is it really wrong to think there's a right and wrong? No. Well, <laughs> how, do you, how do you respond to that? That sentence is wrong. <laughs> this sentence can't be done. Uh, this, this is an impossible sentence, philosophically. So their position is self-defeating. A lot of things are. So here, here's, a, here's an example of how to discern things. Some arguments just in the way they state them in a sentence or, or orally. When a philosopher or a person on TV or radio or in your church, uh, a member or a speaker, a guest speaker, if anybody makes a sentence that's self-defeating, 
then, you know, listen for that self-defeating statement. And then help the person understand that what they just said is an internal contradiction. It, it destroys itself. Seems right and wrong with their innocence. For example, if I said, if I said that all teachers should teach relativism, could I be a teacher? No. If I said all teachers, that, mean, that includes me, all teachers should teach relativism. And all teachers uh, are relativists. If I said that, no. could I teach you right now? No. Why not? What did Socrates say about relativistic teachers yesterday? If, if, I, if I were a relativist and I'm your teacher, can I, can I keep on teaching? No, 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 no it's no better than what you believe. So you don't need my teaching. I don't need to teach because I have nothing to offer that's better than what you have. I can, I can say words. I can take up your time. You might be entertained, but it's no better than what you already have because there's no such thing in relativism as better. There's just that and this. You can say there's that, there's this. Okay. But you can't say that's better, that's worse. Because that, that's not relativism. That, those are absolutes. And yet these people, again, they do it all the time. They, they, they teach relativism and they say, come to my class. You need to learn this. This is better than the other view. And they contradict their own view. They shouldn't even teach if they're going to practice their relativism. So look at the bottom, the bottom number three under Moreland and Craig, number three. Here's that written for you. Typical belief in an existence of absolute moral absolutes among humans and cultures is so strong and historical and universal that it is improbable that its real objective existence can be convincingly denied. For example, it is self-defeating to say that relativism is, and that means objectively, the right view. Because an objective right supposedly does not even exist. Therefore, they contradict themselves. So a relativistic teacher cannot promote relativism as a better view because that goes against their own view. Next handout. Okay. Thank you. Now here's a scary statement I'm going to make and it's happening every day in front of our eyes before our very eyes. If there are no absolute morals then nothing absolutely nothing can ever be called wrong. That's scary. Isn't that happening today? This, this value of being tolerant isn't that, a, isn't that a strong value today, being tolerant? Mm -hmm. Not judging? If you watch uh, talk shows and, uh, and so forth, people are, all, are quick to say, don't judge me. You can't judge me. Back off. You know, I have, I have my own view. Uh, you don't judge me. You just, you just tolerate me. If, if you take this argument too far, and it's going that far already, in terms of relativism, then nothing 
can ever be called wrong. It's happening today. Sodomy cannot be called wrong anymore. Who are you to, who are you to judge a sodomist? So, of course, again, that means that the relativist could never complain about anything you do to him or her. But would they complain in real life if a, if a so-called bad thing were done to them? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I say absolutely on purpose. Absolutely. Every time. Absolutely. Not relatively, but absolutely. They would recognize a wrong was done to them. And yet, again, they make their money by teaching that there is no absolute right or wrong. So look at this first paragraph. This is from Kreeft. With some input by me. You have, you have two problems here. If you can't say anything is wrong, you also can't say anything is right. You can never say X is right. You can never say Y is wrong. Look at the first paragraph. If there is no objective, universal, real, right or wrong, then one cannot absolutely be right. If this is the case, no one can really absolutely be right to promote subjectivism or relativism regarding morality. To be right is contradictory and self-defeating. Similarly, if there is no real absolute wrong, like sodomy, then one cannot really absolutely be wrong. So you can never be wrong or right in life if this is the right view. If this is the case, no one can absolutely say it's wrong to promote objective morality. Additionally, no one can really absolutely condemn anything such as murder, child torture, house burning, stealing. You can never say that's wrong. All you can do is say, hmm, wow, they just killed my mother. Hmm. (laughs) Took my child and tortured it. Hmm. Him or her, I shouldn't say it. It's not a womb entity, it's a person. All my money I worked for teaching relativism. It's all gone, stolen. Hmm. They don't say, hmm, very much. They usually say, that's not right. Next next paragraph. And we're we're going this direction. Sort of, sort of not. Here's a contradiction in this next paragraph about people not being able able to live by their own worldview. If right and wrong are the only subjective, is only a subjective and... I'm sorry, object, subjective decision or law of the one or ones with power, like a government, then it is wrong for citizens to try to change or improve the government or to rebel against it because there can be no objective better or worse. You follow that? If we, if we were all a country of relativists and we're heading that way, then when the government does something that you don't like, You should never complain and say, you know, this is worse than I thought it was going to be. Our government is worse than I thought. There is no worse. Worse is not relativism. Worse is an absolute thing. And you can never say, let's protest. Let's march in the streets to make this government better. There is no better in 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 the universe of relativism. So you can never protest or complain. There is no better, there's no worse. So there there cannot not be any protesting, there can be no marching, no letters to the editor, no letters to the senator, because there is no such thing as better or worse. But again, people who believe relativism cannot apply this. They do march in the street. They do write letters to the editor and to the senator. They do claim, because they want things better. So they contradict their own view. In the, in the relativistic world, a citizen would have to accept anything that decides. Our treat, no party for freedoms, forced slavery, without pay, etc. The people don't accept those things because they don't think it's right. Okay, the last sentence. Furthermore, 
here's, a, here's an interesting contradiction against their own view. Furthermore, there can be no real promotion of tolerance. When a person says on a talk show, stop judging me and my lifestyle. Be tolerant. Where in that sentence is there an absolute? Stop judging. <laughs> stop judging. It's wrong to judge me. It's always wrong. That's an absolute. And there's one more absolute. Be tolerant. They're giving a law there. They're saying you should act under the universal law called tolerance. Be tolerant. You see, again, what did I say yesterday? That invisible laws of morality are no different in essence than that wall right there. Physically, you keep walking toward a wall, you're going to bump into it. And morally, if you violate moral laws, you also bump into it. Truth cannot be denied continually, whether it's physical or spiritual truth. If it's true, because it is true, it's a law, and if you break the law long enough, you'll, you'll pay a price for that, whether it be the breaking the law of gravity or breaking the law of morality. Truth is truth. Laws are laws. Absolutes are absolutes. That wall is an absolute, and so are moral laws. And people cannot live by them long without going crazy or ending in a, in a contradiction. So they can't even talk. They can't speak a sentence without breaking their own law, their own theory. When they say, you don't judge me, be tolerant. They can't even put words in a sentence without breaking their own view and without, without indicating our view is correct. Because they cannot even talk without being absolute. All they can do to be consistent again is say, hmm. But they don't. They make sentences. They talk. And they, they contradict themselves. So you cannot promote tolerance if you're a relativist. Because it's intolerant. What's that? Because that would be intolerant. That would be intolerant. So, okay, here's how it gets ridiculous. Okay, I'm a teacher. You're a student right now. If I gave you a test right now, and if I'm a relativist, and I give you a test, what kind of answers are you able to give if we're going to practice relativism? Anything you want. Put down anything you want as your answer. And I cannot, what? Judge. Say you're wrong. I cannot say you're wrong for your answer. And I also can't say you're right, you're right if I don't want to. You can agree with us. All I can say, all I can do is look at your papers. Uh, two, plus, two plus two equals, and David says red. We had a conversation about red. All I can do is say, hmm. Okay, next, next page. Two plus two equals Santana, the guitar player. Hmm. Next page. Yeah. And what kind of a grade am I going to give you? Hey. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, there, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's no better, there's no worse. And both of us can't even put a grade down there except, hmm, yeah. A, a, new, a new kind of grade. Hmm. But again, relativists who teach relativism, they do give grades. That means they judge. That means there are wrong answers and right answers. If you put on a test for a relativistic teacher, I believe in objectivism. Don't mark it wrong. This is wrong. The right answer is relativism. They can't do that and be a relativist. Okay, I mentioned this before our last module, this third paragraph. There was a study done, a fascinating study. So for those who were not in apologetics, look at this third paragraph especially. Go to the third line, fourth line, fourth line. A researcher by the name of J.D. Unwin he studied about 80 different fallen cultures. Cultures that fell. They're either gone now or they're soon to be gone in terms of what they were when they were a young culture. He found that the common factor, the common denominator among these 80 plus different cultures in history was all the same. 
And this, this is scary regarding where we live now in America. What is that one common denominator? What was the one most common thing that caused all 80 cultures to fall? Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Notice I say immorality. Because in all those 80 cases, and also as the case in America, when those cultures were young and thriving and healthy, they had sexual practices that were not what they were at the end. They would be, for the most part, moral sexual practices. They punished immoral sexual practices. Now, here's, here's a quick snapshot of hap what's happening in our country. When I was uh, a boy, I met a man at a hamburger joint in Texas, and he just got out of prison. I said, why were you in prison? He said, I was arrested for fornication. I had to go home and look in my dictionary what that was. I didn't know what that was yet. It was a new word for me. But he said he went to prison because he was caught fornicating. Would that happen today? Yeah. Would a person go to jail today for fornicating? No way. Of course not. They, they, they wouldn't even, uh, even try to arrest you. Now, when Kobe Bryant... Now, I, I find this interesting. Now, now we jump ahead to 2005 or 2004. Kobe Bryant was arrested, as you know. Uh, what was his, his supposed crime? Okay, he, he was accused of raping someone. Now, he was married at the time. Now, there are two things I find shocking about that case, although I'm kind of uh, hardened to it by now as an American, but I noticed two things, and here's some, here's some discernment that I, I think we can all apply to this, this case. When, when Kobe Bryant was arrested for accused rape, he was a married man. Now, in terms of the Bible and in terms of previous American culture, what was he guilty of apart from the accused rape? Adultery. adultery. Okay. Adultery used to be, if you're old enough like I am to remember, adultery used to be against the law in America. You know, adultery is another form of fornication. It's an immoral kind of sexual contact. Okay. Was he ever uh, criticized for... No. Adultery? No. Uh, legally? No. Okay, now he, he was criticized by people like us and, and people who still, ha still have moral values, but legally, that was never in question. Never in question that he was uh, guilty of a crime called adultery. Those are, uh, those are the old days. They're gone now. Now you can be an adulterer and there's no legal problem. And secondly, uh, from a legal point of view, uh, in terms of marriage contract, what happens if you sign a contract? Let's say that uh, you sign a contract. If you're if you're a, an engineer or a contractor and you're going to build a house for somebody and you have a contract, what if you violate your contract? Is there are there legal consequences? Oh, yeah. yeah, you can be sued and go to court. But if you break your marriage contract, which is a legal document, you sign your name, it's a legal contract that I promise, you know, I'll be the husband, she's the wife, sign our name, or it's a contract. If you break your contract and have adultery, do you go to court? In general, no. Uh, you're not in trouble if you break your, your marriage contract. So again, I'm shocked that we don't have any repercussions today with breaking the contract, nor just the spiritual part or the social part of being unfaithful to your partner. So there's an example how far we've come in just, you know, 40-some uh, years from the man I met in the restaurant who came out of jail because he was caught fornicating, which now is like, well, what's the big deal with that? All the way to you can break your, make your, break your marriage contract and be an adulterer and there's still no ramification legally. So he found in the study, that's what was the number one factor in all these 80 cultures that fell. Sexual immorality, which means we're on the way to a fall. Yeah. We have been for some time now. Right. No culture lasts forever. Uh, the, the name might stay the same. You know, Egypt still has a name, but the Egypt today is not what Egypt was before. Yeah. It's a different culture today. So the ancient Egyptian culture fell. Uh, but in most cases, even the name is erased from the map. Most cultures that fall, there's no longer a name in the map. Uh, it's replaced by a different name. So this is a very shocking study. And of course, you may have heard before the, the well-known example of the Roman Empire. 
how did Rome really fall? From outside or inside? Inside. inside. That's how cultures fall most of the time is from the inside. So that's how we're falling right now is from the inside. We are the world superpower, the, the sole superpower we, we, we talk about, or at least CNN talks about. But we're falling on the inside from moral rot, moral decay, and mostly in the area of sexuality. Look at all the vices going on. Pornography, for example, and you know, fornication, adultery. Those are all sexually, sexually related. The homosexual issue, sexually related. Most sins that, that are uh, destroying us are sexually related. Just like the pattern he found in, among 80 different cultures. Okay, we'll stop there for this portion of our DVD.